What's going on, everybody? I am Winston A. Marshall, aka The Swaggy Blurred, and this is my episode 7 review of X Men 97 entitled Bright Eyes. Now, before we get started, if you're new to the channel, you already know what to do. You need to go down, hit that subscribe button, hit the notification bell, so then that way you know anytime I'm putting some new content up. I've been covering all of X Men 97, I've been doing comedy stuff on this channel. Like, if you're new here, look around, check some stuff out might get you geeked out, and definitely will make you wanna come and check out some of the other stuff I got going on. But for right now, the main thing I want you to focus on is this. This is a spoiler review. So if you haven't seen episode seven uh, entitled Bright Eyes, get out of here, come on back. I'm gonna be here, don't even worry about it. I go a full breakdown of the episode and give you a little tidbits about some stuff you may or may not know about the X-Men and the characters in it. And I talk about some of the storytelling, the acting, all that good stuff. So I'm really that person that's gonna break it all down for you. So with that, let's skip all of the chit chat, man, and let's jump right into it. Now, again, this is uh, episode seven in, of X-Men 97 called Bright Eyes. And uh, first thing we see right away in the title sequence is a teaser. Now, for, for those that haven't been paying attention, these teasers that you've been seeing in the intro they keep changing it up right they're typically teasing history that is involved in the episodes and so in this particular case we see master mold in nimrod so that giant sentinel there is master mold that little figure right there uh, that, as we see because they do zoom in during the intro sequence is nimrod and nimrod being one of the most dangerous sentinels that's ever been created from the future all that good stuff which is a tease as to who is ultimately behind the giant attack on Genosha. We'll get to that as we go through the actual episode. But the main thing that we get right away, uh, entitled Bright Eyes, is the funeral of Gambit. At the funeral, we see people that have loved Gambit and have been in Gambit's life his entire life, as you see in most funerals. Uh, and some of the highlights uh, and cameos that you see there include Gambit's brother, um, you also see uh, Gambit's love interest when he was a part of the Thieves Guild. If you're unfamiliar with what I'm talking about, go check out X-Men the Animated Series and look up the episode entitled Externally Yours, uh, where we get a little bit more of an insight into Gambit um, and where he is coming from. And that uh, covers his time giving the ties to the external and all that kind of stuff. Go, go look it up. Probably my favorite cameo by far uh, in this moment, it's not really a cameo, just just a a great moment. Is we get to see the young Reverend Kurt Wagner, who clearly gives sermon weekly at the Saint Ebenezer United Methodist Baptist Church down on Crenshaw and Olympic. He moved through his life as a force who believed better mm. times lay ahead. That luck always won. Yes. Her his kinetic gifts. Gambit had endless faith. You better Gambit preach it. A sinner beyond saving. Mm -hmm. Such mm -hmm. was the cards, he'd say. I think he was bluffing. Ooh, you better how preach it. Go on, Pastor. So tuned to potential, fail to see how his sins had made him into a hero. That boy was a hero. Every gambler has a tell. Mm -hmm. But the Lord knows. Was Gambit's. Amen. <laughs> no, but real talk, man. I thought that this was a beautiful way to take uh, what Kurt is most known for, and that is his uh, religion. Other than the teleporting, other than the blue fur and the tail, it's his religion. He's a devout Christian, uh, formerly a monk. Uh, and so for him to serve as the presiding reverend uh, the residing reverend uh, over this service I thought was a beautiful touch and made the most logical sense. Uh, now, the one person who isn't at the funeral and probably seems like the most important person to be there was actually Rogue. And here's why. Trespassing. Cease and... Yes! Uh, 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 
She was too busy kicking everybody's ass. We get this incredible cameo from General Thunderbolt Ross, which, by the way, we get a lot of really great cameos in this show, but especially in this episode, and I'm talking about beyond the people that were involved in X-Men the Animated Series, uh, we're talking about it, the greater Marvel Universe as a whole. So we get General Thunderbolt Ross, um, and we'll talk about the other major Marvel cameo coming up in just a minute. But Rogue, after whooping the ass of this military base, is getting closer and closer to who is really behind it. She's destroying everybody in her path till she finds out who took Remy away from her. Meanwhile, you actually get uh, Scott with the rest of the X-Men as they kind of gear up to, to head to Genosha. Actually, if I remember correctly, he's they're already on Genosha. And you get this conversation between Scott and President Kelly. Finding even one more survivor could give mutants some hope. Folks are frightened. They think Dr. Trask just kicked off an all-out war between humans and mutants. And if scared voters see me helping your kind... Uh, sorry, son. Just, uh, unfortunate optics. And President Kelly says that he can't help uh, in this particular case to really be there to help with the evacuation, the search protocol anymore because of optics. Optics. Say that to the man that shoots optic blasts. I'm not kidding you, which I'll be honest with you is again, when the show is written and everything else is not directly lining up to things happening in the world at this moment. This was written and filmed and animated a while ago, but it's very interesting because the one thing that tends to be true above all else is that politicians will look out for themselves. That's right, I said it. And in this particular case, uh, President Kelly realizes that if he shows too much favor towards the mutants during all this, especially in a time where people think there's gonna be a civil war, or not a civil war, but a world war between mutants and humans, uh, he realizes that he probably shouldn't get involved, which I think is very stupid, but honestly, I appreciate the fact that the realism of politicians was kept here. They didn't just write something off and all kumbaya. It's exactly what would happen in what feels like a major international crisis with, you know, essentially a bunch of superpower beings that are walking nukes in a lot of ways and, and the fear that is stoked uh, by humanity against mutants and what could potentially come of this, which we're going to get more and more into seeing that. As a matter of fact, um, before we jump back to Genosha and talk more about that, again, we mentioned Rogue, and Rogue goes and meets our next major cameo of this episode, and that is none other than Steve Rogers, a.k.a. Captain America. <clears throat> Stand down, Rogue. Please. Gyrick was transferred to a facility in Mexico City. Once I get the thumbs up, I'll lead my team to Mexico to apprehend Gyrick. This uniform shows up in Mexico bashing heads in with you. It sends a message. Damn right that you stand with mutants. Unless you don't now. Gotta do this by the book, Rogue. Right now, my hands are tied. Well, if your hands are tied, you won't be needing this. <laughs> Bro, you see the way she yeeted the hell out of that shield? She said, yeet! Like, real talk. She was not here for cap shit. Um, but again, Rogue is on a tear, man. She is out here trying to figure out who is the cause of uh, the death of her loved one. Um, and I really love, again, we're gearing up towards the X-Men being live action the MCU. I think this was brilliant to continue to bring in random elements from Marvel and show that the X-Men are a part of it. So showing Thunderbolt Ross, who's about to be in the Thunderbolts, showing Captain America, who obviously we don't have Chris Evans as Steve Rogers anymore, but you're greater tying the X-Men to the rest of Marvel to remind everybody that they're all part of that same universe, I thought was a brilliant touch. Now again, we've seen Captain America before. If you go look up the episode in the final season called Old Soldiers, you get the storyline of when Wolverine and Captain America were fighting in uh, a world war together. So definitely go and check that out as well. Not my favorite season of X-Men the Animated Series, but that was a pretty good episode to see Cap and Wolverine teaming up together in a fun little cameo of 
Wolverine getting his claws. Um, but after that, we go back to Genosha as the evacuation continues and you see Beast walking uh, with, I believe her name is Trisha, um, uh, the reporter that was doing the expose on the X-Men previously. And there's a lot of conversation about what's going on and like, oh, you know, the Trisha is like, you know, we really need people to stop rioting and whatnot and beast goes well riots are the language of the unheard and trisha knows the quote and that's a quote from martin luther king that's the truth and again this is where i do see a lot of similarities i know that uh Bodomeo has been quoted on twitter of saying you know this that uh the massacre of genosha uh and the way that it was presented was supposed to be more of a allegory for 9-11 in this particular moment, not to say that there weren't crazy things like that, I think the riots and the stuff that's coming from it and the the quote unquote impo like um, uh, impending race war was very was way more reminiscent of in the '90s the LA riots that happened post Rodney King and everything like that. Uh, but then also uh, George Floyd. After George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, there were some riots as well uh that were happening around the same time as the peaceful protests um and again it's exactly as that martin luther king quote uh is read riots are the language of the unheard and beast is full of quotes uh which is one of his major things but the thing that eases the tension because beast is clearly not here to talk to trisha anymore and you're starting to see a lot of mutants be done with playing nice smashing windows is destruction not communication normal people won't accept mutants if they feel threatened that fear is the whole issue. Perhaps the professor's vision for the future was too nearsighted, and begging for your tolerance was our first mistake. Hank, no, that's not what I was saying. But it is what you mean. This idea of Charles's we can all live together kumbaya is not really sticking in the minds of mutants, which makes me wonder if the end of season one will actually produce another nation for mutants, and by that I mean the nation of Krakoa, which even though we haven't seen that in any of the 90s comics or anything before that, that's a recent storyline, there have been tiny little hints to uh, Krakoa, including the, the ball that was happening during all of this uh, really feels more reminiscent of the, the massacre that then happened on Krakoa. You did have a massacre in uh, E is for Extinction, but correct me if I'm wrong, you can say in the comments, but be polite about it. We ain't here starting no bullshit. You heard what I said. Um, you do, you, you, you had this ball where all of the, the, the mutants were gathered together and you met the new X-Men team and then here in comes uh, Nimrod and a massacre of mutants there too. This happens more times than we would care to like. Uh, that's a whole other conversation for another video that, you know, maybe that's something that we talk about is the various different um, unfortunate events in which uh, humans have tried on a mass level to exterminate mutants or something awful, obviously uh, House of M storyline with the normal mutants line. Anyway, uh, point is uh, in all of this, the, 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 the point that breaks the tension Emma Frost is found. There haven't been any survivors found for days. And Emma Frost is found. And it turns out that she has uh, a diamond transmutation and has never been known as one of Emma's abilities. So for those that know, Emma Frost, very powerful telepath, probably the third most powerful telepath on Earth but behind uh, Jean and Charles. Jean having the most raw potential. Charles being the most refined. So he's probably the second most raw power powerful telepath but because of his years of experience and use with his his abilities he tends to outclass gene uh in that but uh you know hold the conversation for another day emma in the e for extinction event that is where she actually in a similar fashion manifests her second abilities under distress being able to turn into a diamond form um and fun fact uh emma's diamond form was actually brought about by the writers because there was a recent death of colossus and so they wanted to be able to replace um the kind of invulnerable uh fighter on the team the writers did so they gave emma diamond powers cool thing if you didn't know about that you should also go look that up anyway all that being said you, you get this moment and it gives a little bit of hope and relief uh you also then get a message from trask 
saying, I didn't think that Sinister was going to be doing all this. You guys should come. I believe it's to Manjapur and says something along the lines of when you get here, the diet soda is never out of stock, which is clearly a code word, but all the X-Men know it's a trap, but they're headed there anyway. All this is going on. You actually get Jubilee going with Roberto to meet Roberto's mom and to finally say the truth about his mutant abilities. And that's where you actually get Roberto's mom being like, your father and I always knew, but we just agreed it was your secret to tell, which I thought was a beautiful moment. Um, again, the X-Men have represented uh, marginalized people of all different wavelengths, of all different groups, all different types. Uh, in this particular case, as happened with X2 and Iceman and this, uh, Roberto coming out to his parents as a as a mutant is more reminiscent of uh, being gay. And again, Bo DeMeo, the creator of X-Men 97, being a gay man himself, I thought that this was a beautiful little touch to kind of put that in there. And it's, you get two things that happen in this moment. First, the beautiful moment of the parents being like, we always knew, but it wasn't our secret to tell. We wait for you when you feel comfortable telling us. I thought that was great. The flip side of it is when you have family members that quote unquote have something to lose, uh, in this case, since they are super mega rich, the concern now that there might be a war between mutants and humans. Now she's like, but we got to keep this secret between us. Uh, we can't let the world know that our son is a mutant. And that I thought was another really poignant thing that happens a lot of times where a parent, you're worried that they won't accept you uh, if you end up being queer. And then you come out to them and they're like, we always do and we still love you, no big deal. But then there's a whole different level of hurt that comes by being like, but you have to keep it secret. So essentially you tried to come out of the closet and then ultimately you're shoved right back into it in order to keep up the the you know the facade for family members or friends. And, and that's really painful to see, but it was a really great thing to include because I think that that's a real world thing that you see queer people dealing with on a regular basis. Um, you do end up seeing that again on Rogue's quest for revenge, um, she is hurt and she's searching here and she is stopped by her brother Nightcrawler uh, and they have a very touching moment. Rami's dead, but that don't mean I'm ready to accept it. We all grieve in our own way. You sure pulled the short straw in the adopted sister department, didn't you? Got the gal who goes bonkers over losing a boy. Over losing two. And her confusion is only natural. But she did not cause Gambit or Magneto to be killed. She helped them live. I just thought that this was truly beautiful, even though they only got to know each other as siblings for a short period of time here, and we don't really explore it much other than the kind of Nightcrawler's origin episode and a little, you know, friendly banter uh, in the episode, Remember It. It was really nice to see this older brother be there for his younger sister, his younger adopted sister. I thought that was very beautiful. Um, you end up in a situation where the X-Men do go to the facility. They find all these advanced robotics and they eventually find Trask who's about to jump off of a building because he can't handle the fact that he caused this massacre um, uh, or that he was inadvertently behind it by making the Sentinels in the first place, but by going along with Sinister's plan. And so he tries to jump off and Rogue saves him and you get this crazy moment. Easy boy. You want redemption? Help us get the real bad guys. What else can you tell us? Innocent helps. I have nothing. Same sugar. Hogue, what have you done? What we all wanted to do. <sighs> Is this who we are now? That maniac killed Remy and thousands of people on Genosha. That rotten piece of scum put a good man, my man... Terminate! The one thing that I think is pretty interesting here, originally the uh, E4 Extinction event 
Uh, Genosha loses 16 million mutants. So if she's saying a few thousand, if we're taking her kind of at her word that she's watched the news and was, uh, you know, aware of how many are there, that the number has come down significantly. Um, but it doesn't mean it's still not tragic. Doesn't mean it's still not insane. Um, but just trying to see if we're comparing stories one for one, it's not direct. Uh, it looks like it's a few thousand instead of a few million. Um, in this moment, though, as this is all going on, Trask is now a sentinel he is a sentinel he's a prime sentinel um and for those that are unfamiliar with prime sentinels that is uh, a process in which the big bad who we're going to get to starts infecting humans with uh nano nano machines essentially uh and it makes them essentially cyborgs it makes them human sentinels um which god is probably the x-men's worst fear if you think about it because sentinels the giant robots are terrifying enough and the humans making them and their hate is also ridiculous but now you're taking what happened in the beginning and this is where i feel like there's a lot of serendipity kind of coming through in all of this and really great storytelling the evolution of the humans and their hate and their ability to hate and be hateful and destroy and kill mutants you had them with essentially Mega Man blasters before, and now they are fully Mega Man Death Squad agents, whatever, Terminators, whatever you want to call it, uh, with Trask being the first one here. Um, but here's one thing I wanted to talk about. Gene's power upgrade. Now, one of the things that I always hated about X-Men the Animated Series is how depowered Gene was if she's not the Phoenix. Um, Gene is an insanely powerful telekinetic. And so in this particular moment, she's able to hold up half a building and th chunk it out of the way while also making sure Scott lands on the ground properly. You get the building. I'll get the debris. Ah! in her power scale than what they've been doing before where she's like oh oh wait logan's falling oh <laughs> so i really appreciate that they gave her her just do here and not the fact that she's just you know the phoenix that's the only reason why she's strong now now trask sentinel prime is a badass he whoops the hell out of the x-men and they barely get out of it because Scott happens to meet his son, his grown son. They've met Cable before, but they didn't recognize it. But Gene reads Cable's mind and goes, oh, my God, it's it's. And that's when Scott goes, oh, my God, you're Nathan. Cable, what the hell are you doing here? Huh. Eyes. No, all along, it can't be. Get out of my brain. You're not her. Oh, my God. Nathan, let's skip the reunion, Dad. And we get this touching moment where Cable and, and Scott get a, get a split second, but Cable's already like, we ain't got time for this. It's way worse than you thought. Um, and if you remember, and remember, he says he's coming, he's coming. Um, and what he's referring to was not the Master Mold, Godzilla, uh, the Wild Sentinel, which also, by the way, there's a number of people in my comments when I called it a Master Mold, they tried to be like, no, it's a Wild Sentinel, it was the Godzilla Sentinel, and I was like, motherfucker, that looks like a Master Mold head, it looks like three Master Mold heads typed onto one, it was a Wild Sentinel Master Mold combo, kiss my ass. My point is... He warns that there is a much bigger bad that's behind all of this, behind Sinister, which we see Sinister talking to for a while. And ultimately, we see in this other hidden base, we see Magneto is tied up. He's got a collar around his neck. He's been growing out this beard, essentially. And then we get the big bad Bastion, who is over here shaving Magneto because he clearly has bigger plans uh, for Magneto. And that is where we end the episode, which... I gotta be honest, I really enjoyed it, but it does not hold weight compared to the other episodes, but a lot of times that's what exposition does. When you're when you're kind of, the dust is settling from a major episode, like a Red Wedding, um, or, you know, anything you've seen in Breaking Bad or anything like that, typically the, the episode follow-up where you're kind of moving on to the next steps isn't quite as palpable, but it is important. 
and that's what I feel. So if I had to rate this episode, like every other episode, it's very good. I'll give it like a 3.75, maybe a four, somewhere in that range, probably closer to a four. And again, not because it's bad, but when you've had your foot on the gas so much in this series, and especially recently, it takes a little bit of the edge out of the episodes that don't. Um, and again, not a bad episode by any mean or stretch of the imagination. It just, we have been blown away by other episodes. So that's the only thing that kind of holds this one back. But some of the things that I thought were just so cool here, you're, you're bringing in, you're, you're doing an expert job of threading stories from various books and making them work together as part of this adaptation and that's really what it is and you've brought in bastion who a lot of people i was thinking it was going to be cassandra nova but bastion was a good call i saw people saying that um and and i think he would be he's going to be a great final big bad including the fact that you kept seeing ozt i didn't say this earlier but that stands for operation zero tolerance this is this anti-mutant mili paramilitary group that was originally kind of funded through the u.s government but kind of branched off and you get the u.s government and shield and the x-men all being like we got to shut them down um i'm gonna be very curious if captain america makes another appearance he may or may not uh if we're gonna get anybody else or if it's just the x-men taking it down it would make more sense and would feel better if it was just the x-men if you got a little bit of say the avengers or shield i don't think that's a bad thing to kind of show that mutants uh, uh, you know, do can get along with humans and uh, human protectors and all that kind of stuff. But it's an X-Men show. The X-Men should be at the center of all of this. If we get any sort of cameos from all those types of characters in the final battle, it really needs to be a cameo. They can't be at the, the key center point, especially because we haven't really introduced them in the course of this show. But that's just my opinion. Um, all that being said, I really enjoyed this. What did you think? Please tell me down in the comments what you thought about the show, about the episode, how you feel about where we're going now. Our final three episodes are called Tolerance is Extinction, parts one through three. So we're essentially going to go in here and we're going to wrap all this up as the X-Men attempt to um, save the day. Obviously, from Life, Death, Part 2, we know that Charles is coming back. So that's going to be a big thing. And we'll see how Charles can help influence um, the X-Men in this final battle or if him coming back actually throws more of a wrench in the whole situation. Uh, is Cable going to go time travel and try and save Gambit? I will tell you, I hope he doesn't do that. Not because I don't love Gambit. I do. But I think storytelling wise, it takes a lot of this energy and a lot of the wind out of the sails if you just automatically retcon Gambit's death within a couple episodes you know what i'm saying that it doesn't have quite the hit if you want to bring him back late season two or season three or something like that cool like we i can live with that but if the, we're telling this story and let's say let's say in a world where there wasn't uh more seasons of this coming out because this has been approved for three seasons and the second one's been written and the third one hasn't yet let's let's say that this was this was it leaving gambit dead is a much stronger storyline don't think about the future. Just think about that. That is a much stronger storyline. It gives you something to rally around. It gives an emotional weight to it. I don't want to see that change. But again, leave that in the comments. I want to know what you think. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to the channel, man, and hit that notification bell so that you can get notified of things that are coming on this channel. I appreciate each and every one of you that have been joining. I'm on a journey now to really build this channel out. I got to say, I, I appreciate so many of you. Uh, in about a week's time, we've gained an additional 300 subscribers. And then and the bar just keeps pushing. So I, I really want to thank everybody that's new here and that's doing the damn thing. If you haven't seen me already over on Capes and Cows with Christian Harloff, be sure to go over and do that with uh, Christian Akoy. Um, I won't be there this week, sadly. Uh, I have uh, another project that I'm working on, but definitely do that. And again, stay here. I've got some stuff I'm working on, including a short film that's very near and dear to my heart, which I'll talk more about in another time. Uh, but with all that, I'm going to get out of here because I'm exhausted. It's two in the morning as I'm recording this. Uh, and I need to get some sleep so I can work tomorrow. So with that, I'm going to see you all in the next one, y'all. Y'all stay safe, man. Peace.